one player on the Chiefs, if he grows into a better version of himself, they are going to win the Super Bowl. If he doesn't, they might win a single playoff game, if that. Ladies and gentlemen, coming to you from the Spit Studios in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, this is the Spit Sports Show. Goodness gracious me, it has been way, way too long. So the reason I was gone for so long isn't because I fell out of love with football or sports or you guys or anything like that. Um, I was in Palm Springs for the week, and with that, I was only a two-hour drive from Los Angeles, so I had the privileged blessing and honor to be able to see the Detroit Lions versus Los Angeles Chargers game live. Now, I didn't have a studio with me there. I didn't have a microphone, which just devastated me because all I wanted to do after that game was talk about it with you guys. I was dying inside to be able to just throw out all my feelings, what I was able to see live, the atmosphere of it. But I wasn't able to because I didn't have the equipment. I'm not going to talk about that now because that's old news. However, I do want to disclose something to you guys before I get into what we're actually talking about today. we got Eagles uh, Chiefs stuff coming up. We've got some Lions stuff coming up. We've got some right or wrong stuff. New segment coming up. So excited about that. But before I do, the personal connection to this show is very important to me. Anybody can really talk sports, but no one... I don't think anyone can talk sports quite like I can. So I'm going to be totally authentic with you guys. I am recording this at 3.30 p.m. I had a dentist appointment at 2 p.m. where they froze up my mouth completely so I could have fillings in my teeth. However, they only did the top. All right, so if my lips look weird throughout this recording or I'm I'm emphasizing different words differently, you know, just like I did there, I apologize. It's because of that, but I don't have a whole lot of time in my life right now, so I'm going to try to get a podcast episode out. So let's get into it. Chiefs Eagles last night, I was able to watch the whole thing. Um, It was not as entertaining a game as I thought it was going to be. I thought it was absolutely fascinating, though. There's a difference between entertaining and interesting. Entertaining is where like the general fan can watch the game and be like, oh yeah, that was sick. Interesting is more like people like me can look at the game, analyze different things and realize that we discovered something new about a team that was playing. And I definitely realized something new about the Chiefs yesterday. Okay, so the story is obviously going to be that MVS drop and that Watson drop and that Kelsey fumble and all the errors that the Chiefs receivers made and have made throughout the season. And I totally get that. But in the description of this channel, it says, sick of the same old sport, tired sports narratives, you've come to the right place. So I'm not going to talk about these old tired narratives because I told you guys I wouldn't. I want to talk about something else. And I want to talk about the Chiefs trenches play. Look, since Mahomes came into the league, the Chiefs have kind of had this identity as like this high-flying offense who doesn't really play physically. You know what I mean? They're more just like, even if you're up 21 points on them, they can come back like that. They're just a high-powered, explosive offense with an opportunistic defense who can create a turnover here, get a stop there, but overall, you know, they're probably going to give up about 25 a game. Not anymore. We have to look at this Chiefs team totally differently than we have in the past with Mahomes as the quarterback because their trench play has never been better. Look, the Eagles' calling card and it has been since they won the Super Bowl back in 2018, has been trenches played. Their d line is going to dominate. Their offensive line is going to dominate. And with that, both sides of your ball are going to collapse because that's where the start of football is established. It's established in that offensive and defensive line. The Chiefs' D-line dominated yesterday. They were rushing four and getting constant pressure on Jalen Hurts, who's usually able to avoid sacks really well. But last game, I think they had four sacks in the first half which is the first time that's happened to the Eagles in two years. This is not what the Chiefs' calling card has been, but they were phenomenal. And the amount of protection that Mahomes had, I think all that did was make it more obvious that the receivers weren't doing their job because he constantly had two to four seconds in that pocket to make decisions without even a hand in his face. When you give Mahomes that much time, and he's so precise with the ball and so accurate and so, so powerful that he can fit it into those windows, you got to think the receivers should be able to separate with that much time. So if you're watching that game, you're like, how are those receivers not getting open? I thought their pass blocking was unbelievable. But I realized something new about this Chiefs team. And football is the ultimate team game. 
if one person doesn't do their job, the whole side of the ball collapses, like I just kind of said. So it's hard for me to just say this one player is going to determine their entire season, but I'm going to say it. One player on the Chiefs, if he grows into a better version of himself, they are going to win the Super Bowl. If he doesn't, they might win a single playoff game, if that. Depends on who they're playing. If they're playing the Steelers, they'll whoop them. But Rasheed Rice, guys, he has talent. Everyone can see it. He's the one guy besides Kelsey who can consistently get some sort of separation. However, he's not quite at that number two receiver level yet. He doesn't quite have the jolt. He's very fast. But the two ways you can separate from a corner are you can run faster than him or you can stop faster than him. And the best receivers are great at both. That's what has made Tyreek Hill so dynamic in the past few years. He's figured out how to use his speed well and be able to stop quicker than other people. So it just throws corners into complete disarray. Like, what do I do? Do I speed up to catch up with them? Do I have to play him, you know, in front of me, play him tight? Rice is really good at running fast. He's not good at being slow currently. And if he's able to figure that out, the Chiefs receiving core is set because you got Kelsey as your number one receiver. I know he's a tight end, but he's the greatest pass catching tight end ever. He's your number one receiver. So uh, tight end or not, he's a glorified tight end, whatever. He's their number one. If Rice can become their number two consistently, like putting up numbers, like he doesn't have to be Devontae Smith, but in that kind of area. You know what I mean? A guy on third down, you can count on getting 10 yards on just a simple in route or an out route or just, you know, a basic concept on the route tree. If you have trust in him getting separation and then you have Watson, whom Mahomes seems to really trust as your number three, that's a above average receiving core. But the thing is, Rice is more playing like a number three, number four right now. So they're able to double team, triple team Kelsey, everyone else in man coverage, and you're going to lock the Chiefs up. What they did in the second half was they put a spy on Mahomes and doubled Kelsey. So in theory, the middle of the field is going to be wide open, right? But these receivers, and specifically Rice, they weren't able to get separation from the Eagles' corners, which, by the way, the Eagles' secondary isn't very good. It's gotten better since Bayard got there, but it's not. It's definitely their weakest element, maybe on their entire team. And they still weren't able to get separation, which made Mahomes' life so much harder. Um, Rasheed Rice is going to need to develop for this Chiefs team to be great. They're obviously going to be really good. But if this guy can develop, I don't see why they don't win the Super Bowl again, unless they play the Lions, in which case they'll get smoked, obviously. I'll get to that in a second. But crazy stat I just found, and this isn't just on Rasheed Rice, but 21% of Mahomes' incompletions have come on drops. I don't know what that is. Um, it could be kind of like the LeBron formula. Like whenever it seems like a three-point shooter teams up with LeBron, their percentage just drops because they know that all eyes are on them all the time. And it's never going to be LeBron's fault as a bad pass. You know, you just kind of got to make the shot. So it's an extra level of pressure. I don't know. That's just a little theory I have, but that's a stat I saw and I was just wowed by. Um, yeah, I think this uh, season comes down to Rasheed Rice. But even yesterday, I think the Chiefs could have won that game if Mahomes doesn't throw a straight up bad interception, which he does so rarely. And Kelsey doesn't fumble. It happens, and um, I'm not really worried about the Chiefs at all. They've got one guy who they believe in, clearly, because they didn't go out and get a receiver at the deadline. If he can develop, Chiefs will be just fine. So I want to talk about Lions-Bears. Um, I feel like not enough of the general media is talking about this game and how genuinely historical it was. So I'm going to get to that ending in just a second, but I want to start with the start of the game, which is the Lions just flat out came out flat. They're coming off one of the craziest shootout games that they've played in weeks um 41 38 against the chargers which i was there live for no big deal and they were looking ahead to probably the packers game on thanksgiving which is huge in that division lines packers is obviously a big rivalry for detroit specifically so it might have been the ultimate trap game but i don't care they came out flat their defense looked flat Justin Fields overall I thought played a top three game I've ever seen him play in his career and I've seen quite a bit of Justin Fields football because I'm rooting against him constantly he was moving he had some nice changes in arm angle his um, ability to beat a linebacker one-on-one -on, -one on those read options was just killing us because we'd play it perfectly 
and he'd just still slip out and get five yards, which would put them ahead of the chains and make it harder. He played really, really well yesterday. I thought the one thing he did throughout the game poorly was I thought he handed it off on the read option too many times. The Lions have a really good run defense. And when you just hand the ball up up the middle, that's kind of what they do well because they got bugs in there and big uh, Elaine McNeil. They got some dogs on that in the D tackle spot. So I thought he handed it off too many times and didn't didn't give himself enough op- enough opportunities to make plays. But everything changed in 4.38 seconds. So why do I say 4.38 seconds? When Justin Fields did that stupid dance after that 15-yard carry or whatever it was, and he did his little cha-cha for 4.38 seconds, that's how long the dance lasted, everything flipped on its head. Because this Detroit Lions team, if there's one thing they won't take, it's that kind of disrespect. They are built in Dan Campbell's image. And if you do that kind of dance in front of Dan Campbell's football team, they're going to come out with a new veracity. And that is exactly what the defense did, as well as Justin Fields played. And he played phenomenal. There were three passes that were more important than any other. There were two to DJ Moore, one early in the game that he missed, one later in the game that he hit. Big throw, give him credit for that. And then the third one on the drive where the Bears need probably one, maybe two first downs to seal the victory. Third and 10, he had this the receiver Tyler Scott open by at least a foot and he just missed him. Now, how much does that throw go on fields? I'd say quite a bit, but he did slow up a little bit, so I can't put it all on fields, but he had two of his three big throws he missed on, and that's the difference in the NFL, man. The margins are so thin, especially when you're playing against a team like Detroit, who they just figure out ways to win nowadays, Like, and that's the point that I really want to get across. Like, For the entirety of my, of my existence on earth as a Lions fan, they have constantly just found ways to lose. And yesterday, or on Sunday, they just proved that they can find ways to win. It might be in a shootout. It might be coming back from two possessions with under four minutes and 30 seconds left. And the Bears, who are a bad team, will find ways to lose. Sometimes it just happens like that. We've seen it with the Eagles so many times this year where they've just been outplayed, but they just have that extra gear that pushes them to victories that they probably shouldn't have. And that's what the Lions did. And I think that's the sign of a really good team. Teams down two possessions with under a four minutes and 30 seconds left were 0-84 this season. Now they're 1-84 because those boys from Detroit came and did something special. I wanted to find the last time. This, this is an underrated element. We committed four turnovers in that game and scored 30 plus points. Like, I wanted to find the last time that happened in NFL history, and I couldn't. I only have data that goes back to 2006, all right? And it hasn't happened since then. If it happened in 2005, then whatever. That's still a long time ago. And I think that speaks a lot to how explosive this offense can be, with J- especially with Jamison Williams finally coming into his own. Look, I thought this kid was going to be a superstar. I think he was going to, I thought he was going to be the perfect complement to Amon or St. Brown, and I was right on half of that. He's not going to be a superstar. His routes aren't quite crisp enough yet. And he's not, he doesn't really have the confidence to catch contested, but he is the perfect compliment to Amon or St. Brown. And gosh, did you see it on that play? The corner drop, the safety drops because he's got to respect Amon's out route 15 yards down. And what what does JMO do? Runs right by him for a touchdown. He had at least two yards of separation and got through that ball. It was really impressive to see. And I'm so excited about what's going on with this team. Because they just did something that literally hasn't happened in the NFL this season. And something else that hasn't happened since 2006. Good teams find ways to win. Bad teams find ways to lose. The Lions are a good, good team this year. Don't give me that scheduling nonsense. You play who's on your docket. And we beat the Super Bowl champs in Arrowhead. Enough said. So, new segment time. Um, I've wanted to do this for a while. Um, because I say a lot of things on the show. That's kind of what a podcast is. And I need to be held accountable. 
sometimes I take swings and I hit home runs and sometimes I take swings, spin around three times and fall right on my butt. So this segment, I'm going to call victory lap or wrong about that. So basically I'm going to bring up a bunch of uh, topics that I've discussed and I'm going to decide if I should take a victory lap on it or I was wrong about that. So let's start with the chargers who I need to take a victory lap about. This is what inspired this entire segment. Look, I made three videos before this season about how the Chargers coaching was going to be their demise. If they were to demise, it's, it was going to be because of this guy. I called for his job after that Jacksonville game and even, no, no, even earlier than that, after that Raiders game, that winner get in game where he called that stupid timeout, which the Raiders kicked the field. I don't know if you remember that game, but after that game, I called for this guy's job. I said he was doing Justin Herbert an incredible disservice. And he needed to be let go. Well, the rest of the media definitely seems to be on my side now. They are four and six, even though Justin Herbert is a top five graded quarterback. Look, man, two most important elements to a football team, the head coach and the quarterback. The quarterback's playing well. I think the head coach should take the blame for that. I don't know how he hasn't been fired already. Um, he better be by next year because the Chargers just invested a whole lot in this mini era, you know, signing Derwin James, signing Khalil Mack, giving Bosa the extension. Uh, they signed that Jackson guy. It didn't work out, but they, you know, they took big swings. Hasn't worked out because they don't have the right head coach. And I called that and that has been their demise. So I'm going to take a victory lap about that. The Baltimore Ravens wrong about that. Now, listen, coming into this season, I was pretty confident that the Ravens were going to take a step back just because, I know that Lamar's best element is running and Todd Munkin, I, their previous offense coordinator, I thought was perfect for that. It, he, they have been unbelievable. Lamar has been unbelievable. He has developed so much as a pocket passer and their defense is like, they don't have a lot of big names, but Patrick Queen is a ridiculous linebacker. Their secondary is playing unbelievable and they have the most sacks per game in the league. Did not see this coming. I definitely didn't think their offense was going to be this explosive and it punched my lines right in the mouth. I was wrong about the Ravens this year so far. Um, you know, I was just wrong about them in general. Definitely didn't think they'd be eight and three after 11 weeks. So I was wrong about that. Packers and Jordan Love. Let me take a quick victory lap about this. I said Jordan Love's got talent. I saw him play two games and I said, you know what? This kid can play in the league. He's not hes not a superstar. This isn't Brett Favre to Aaron Rodgers, but he's got some gusto. He's got some talent. He can see the field pretty well. He can make intermediate throws. And would you look at that? With these last few games, passer rating above 90, and he's looked like a solid quarterback. People were ready to totally dip on him after that four-game stretch where he threw something like six, seven picks and just looked abysmal. I was not. Uh, I stuck with it, and I'm going to take a quick victory lap about that because I was right. Big, big victory lap about the Colorado Buffaloes college football team. Now, listen, I hate to be right about a team being bad, but it's one of my most viewed videos, if not the most viewed video on this channel. I said that after they beat TCU in that season opener where the whole world was watching, that that will never happen again because of their O-line and D-line play, their trenches play. They've got all the weapons in the world, but they can't hold up against these good teams in the trenches. And goodness gracious, am I right about that? We've got Deion Sanders at press conferences calling out his O-line. Their defensive line hasn't generated sacks in so long. And overall, they're on a four-game losing streak right now because of their trench play. I hate to say I told you so, but on this one, I absolutely told you so. I This is a victory lap. I made a video called Allen is still way better than Lawrence. Yeah, I was wrong about that. I still don't think Lawrence is the superstar quarterback that he was bigged up to be before that draft. I think he's really good, not great. I'll definitely take Herbert over him in a heartbeat. I'll tell you that, but... Being, him being way better than Allen is just not true. Allen puts his team in position to lose so much more than Lawrence does. It's at least a toss-up at this point. So I was wrong about that. Um, and I'm going to take two quick NBA victory laps. Mavericks, I said before the year, Luka um, would be an MVP candidate. And they would be a top four seed in the West. Well, they are the fourth seed in the West. And LeBron is the greatest athlete of all time. So I'm going to take a small victory lap about that because he has been on a run of four straight games with 30 points and just proving once and for all, this guy, we've never seen anything like this guy. Like, I, I'm going to look into the camera right now and say this. Appreciate him while he's here. 
please. Because he's only got maybe one, two years left of this kind of production. And you're going to get to tell your kids, your grandkids, that you saw this guy play and play at an exceptionally high level. And it's going to be like telling your kids you saw Tom Brady play or like your grandpa told you he saw Jim Brown. You know what I mean? It's, it's a special, special thing that we're watching and appreciate it while it's here. Anyways, that is all for the show today. Thank you guys so much for listening. It was genuinely so nice to get all of these thoughts off my chest. You don't even know. As always, if you have any thoughts, please let me know in the comments below. What do you guys think this week is going to look like at the NFL? Who's going to win between Lions and Packers? Cowboys, how are they going to do? Who's going to win the NFC? I think Detroit still has a chance. They got a pretty light schedule coming up. Let me know. As always, the Spit Sports Show hopefully comes out every other day. I love you all so much. Thank you so much for the continued support. It means the world. And I will see you in the next one. Peace out.